Gumshoe and the Mysterious Mushroom, written by Laura Hawk, read by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter One. The Circle of Life. Take a breath, with each one bringing you closer to the end of your life. Yours. Someone else's. The young take it for granted. Life, that is. Death is the furthest thing from their minds. It certainly wasn't a part of my thoughts. At least I don't remember it that way. Memories are mostly a void, a blackness in my mind, but I get the distinct impression of certain aspects. I feel my life was just beginning. I continue to watch the old, once young and full of energy, then middle-aged and starting families of their own, before meandering through life as the young play at their feet, unaware that in the blink of an eye they will be elderly and wondering where all the time went or how they got so mature so quickly so as not to recognize the wrinkled face and gray hairs reflected back to them in the mirror. I know my appearance is nothing like I remember, the youthful handsomeness no longer staring back at me. I remember I found a beautiful dame who still makes me smile at the thought of her, mm -hmm. even if I can't remember her name. I married her and she gave me a beautiful little girl. Who thought of the circle of life then, of death? of the ages that have long passed and will continue to do so for all eternity. I certainly hadn't. Not then. The world was too perfect. A job I loved, a beginning family, nothing could be better. He lifted his head up, the colorful sky beautiful, with blue, orange, red swirling among big, soft, white, cotton ball-looking clouds passing by serenely without a care in the world. Some of the billowy puffs made recognizable shapes before they slid into unrecognizable blobs as they moved across the sky. Couples walked hand in hand along the shore of the lake or sat cuddled together. Children ran around their parents or ahead of their grandparents while the latter meandered around the paved pathway, enjoying, enjoying the antics of the young. People walked their dogs, teenagers rollerbladed or used hoverboards to glide past those who were in no hurry to get anywhere. The scene was serene, tranquil, but for him sad. He thought the world was his oyster, his life just blossoming into a wonderful adventure with so much to experience and look forward to. What little he could remember of his life was experiencing a lot of death, mostly as a result of a war. It was war, after all. But he returned home, safe and whole. The woman he loved had waited for him, and once he was back home in Illinois, he knew he couldn't let another day go by without making her his forever. Yet forever didn't last as long as he thought it would. He focused his eyes on the young couple pushing a stroller while holding hands. His heart tightened in his chest. He missed his wife and the adorable, curly, blonde-haired baby girl that was the result of the love they had for each other. The sense of self rode through him. Surely, as he was now, he shouldn't be having these memories. We shouldn't be facing the black hole of despair over what memories he'd lost. Everything was just beyond his grasp. Nothing tangible, nothing real. Occasional wisps of his life, as it once was, flickered into being and just as quickly disappeared, slipping through his fingers into oblivion. How cruel life could be, ever-changing, ever-fluid. Time really didn't stand still, and time really didn't heal. It just allowed pain to become more bearable, but not always. There were still moments like these that caused him to cringe and the painful losses caused him to forget how to even breathe as his chest would tighten so much it was a physical ache that, after time, was still unbearable. It brought his current situation to prominent realization even more forcefully once again of how much things had been altered in his very existence. Inwardly, he sighed. He missed his family terribly, and, despite how little he remembered, he knew the heartache of their loss would never truly subside. Lifting his head, he turned back to the sunset and the colorful horizon. The circle of life blossomed all around him and increased his melancholy. He hated it, detested the circumstances that brought him here today. He longed to know what happened to his family. Had they started anew after his human death? Had they forgotten him entirely? He wished he could remember more. Their names, the sounds of their voices, anything. However, it would also be nice if he remembered his own name and how he got here like this. Nothing made sense to him. Nothing seemed real. He watched the setting sun, his furry tail twitching behind him. Chapter 1 Adam Thomas, tall, distinguished. His dark brown hair and sharp blue eyes missed nothing as he moved around the bustling kitchen. It was like watching an ice dancer move so fluidly. 
a twirl here, a spin there, taste of a pot from this area, another from that, a few instructions to his prep staff as he pivoted about the floor. To the untrained eye, it might be mind-boggling with all the work going on simultaneously and yet so fluidly and effortlessly. The team of workers meshed as if one machine, each knowing what needed to be done. Adam's chef jacket was splashed with various sauces and liquids, the only indication he was bustling about so quickly, pulling one pan out, checking on another, finger testing a third, then wiping his hands on his black jacket. He wore the black for prep, gray for the front of the house, and white later in the evening when it was starting to slow down. At least that's how it was at the other restaurant he worked at before the forbidden fruit, and he hadn't planned on changing his routine. The difference was, Adam wasn't just the head chef at the Forbidden Fruit, he was also the owner, along with his wife, Evelyn. Evelyn had a degree in business management. It was how the two of them met 19 years ago in college. Evelyn was the quiet, leggy blonde with brown eyes who attended the school's culinary night. The chef students were also the servers, and Adam waited on her. When the meal was over, they sat and talked until the custodians turned out the lights. He walked her back to her dorm that night, and they've been together ever since. She supported him when he transferred to the Culinary Institute of America. He supported her when she decided to go for her master's degree in business, minoring in accounting. After a couple years of dating, they married, and a year later, Evelyn gave birth to their daughter, Amelia, Mia for short. It was Mia who actually named the new venture. Many called her mom Eve for short, and Mia always teased them that she was their forbidden fruit. Adam thought it was a perfect name for his new restaurant. Mia took after Adam and his love of cooking. Unlike her mother, Mia didn't really have a head for numbers, though she enjoyed some of the other aspects like inventory and going through the applicants to hire. Regardless of all the business end Mia might have liked, her passion was in the kitchen cooking. She started alongside Adam at the age of three, learning how to cook. By age five, Mia had tested items of her own and was creating full course meals. Adam helped to hone her skills and they both exchanged and encouraged her and her passion to cook and bake. Now in the restaurant, he hired his daughter as a prep cook, but unlike the others he hired for that same position, he gave his almost 15 year old daughter a bit more leeway. At home, the two would discuss menus and what she'd contribute to the dinners. Of course, she only got to work as long as her grades were good, and she emphatically promised to maintain her studies. Tonight was the opening night of the Forbidden Fruit, and although she had school, Mia was allowed to miss this one Friday in order to get everything ready for service. Mia proudly planned one full course. A five mushroom soup, a cranberry orange arugula salad, pan-seared duck breast with blood orange glaze, citrus and bacon roasted Brussels sprouts, twice-baked sweet potatoes with caramelized pecans, and a chocolate creme brulee for dessert. There was a lot to do, but Adam knew his daughter could handle it. As head chef, Adam tasted every dish, for it had to be perfect, tonight more than any other. Evelyn was working on the front of the house, dealing with the servers, the linens, and the final touches of decor. Everything had to be perfect. They were sold out, reservation-wise, including having a table of food critics that they all knew could make or break their fledgling empire. Adam moved over to Henry's workstation, watching him clean the fish. Henry looked up, suddenly nervous over the scrutiny, his hand shaking. Henry accidentally sliced his finger as he filleted a white fish. Adam grumbled, moving to the first aid kit. You're the third person tonight to cut themselves. Seems to be an epidemic of nerves, and I'm the one with the opening night. We all just want everything perfect for you. We know how important tonight is. Then all of you need to work without injury and move carefully. There are a lot of bones left, and I don't need a customer getting one stuck in their throat. Yes, chef. Has Dominic checked your fish before cooking? Yes, chef. And watch your knife. Cut the fish, not yourself. Adam put the kid away. Maybe he was making everyone jumpy just with his micromanaging, but this was his first venture as a business owner, and therefore he was even more insistent on everything being perfect. Arriving at his sous chef's station, Adam leaned in to talk softly. Dominic, keep an eye on the fish. Henry is still leaving bones in, and I don't need anyone choking on small fish bones. Check his work before he cooks. I told him he has to check with you before he puts it in the pan. You got it, chef. I'll check on his progress as soon as I finish up here. 
Dominic held the knife down while speaking, turning away from the rack of lamb he was prepping. Have you had a chance to taste the sauces yet from Lee Station? I have. I told him that it was a bit salty and the Bernay was a bit too thick. Adam nodded. Good. I told him the same thing and gave him suggestions on how to correct them. True, Adam could have just fixed them himself, but he wanted his team to know how to deal with problems on their own and for the future. I'll be checking on them again to make sure he corrected them. Good job, Dominic. Dominic nodded and returned to butchering the lamp for prep. Me is doing good, though. Don't be buttering me up just because she's my daughter. Here, she's an employee and will be held to the same stand as I accept for everyone, even myself. Adam patted Dominic on the shoulder. He knew he had to make sure the other cooks didn't feel like they were being held to a different level from his own daughter. He wanted everyone to feel equal despite the different titles they had. Adam looked around his kitchen, proud that although this was the first time they were really all together, they worked like a well-oiled machine. Finally, he turned to his daughter's station. She was moving about rapidly, stirring two pots at a time, chopping her vegetables, juicing her fruit. Adam couldn't have been prouder watching his teenage daughter. Although Adam would admit to being a bit prejudiced, he knew he couldn't appear that way to his other employees. With a purposeful stride, he walked over to Mia's station, clean spoon in hand to test the sauces and dressing she was making. He breathed in the scent of the sauce, then tasted. New spoon and repeated the procedure with the soup. Watched as she prepped the duck breast, slicing the skin for a better and crispier cook. She was still chopping the mushrooms and the blood oranges were being juiced for the duck sauce. She also had a pan to crisp up the bacon with the Brussels sprouts. The soup is a bit loose. I know, Dad. I mean, Chef. I'm going to add some heavy cream to thicken once I get it to f the flavor I like. It's not quite there yet, and I'm not sure why. What does your palate say? Mia smiled. Her dad knew she had a good palate and trusted her senses with regards to spices and flavors. Mm, it's missing something. I'm thinking maybe a touch of garlic? Adam used another spoon to taste the soup again. Hmm, it is a bit earthy right now, so maybe if you roast the garlic first, it might provide the flavor, flavor you were hoping for. Ah, I should have thought of roasted garlic first. Great idea. Turning, she left her workstation to head into the kitchen, grabbing several cloves of garlic. They roasted better in their own skin, so she didn't bother chopping them up. She'd do that when they were ready to be added to the soup. St sticking the pan of garlic cloves in the onion... In the oven, she turned her attention back to her dad, who was still there. Is something else off? I'm not sure. Probably not. What are you thinking? Mia was perplexed, looking around her station and wondering if she'd forgotten everything. Anything, even though she had her menu notes on a small stand of her work area. Just the mushroom soup. It's off, but I can't place as to why. Maybe just the lack of garlic or something else. Call me when you've added the garlic and given it time to infuse. Are you thinking if I can't get it right, will 86 it? She didn't want to pull an item from the menu, much less one she was in charge of, but if it wasn't 100% perfect, she knew he'd cancel it. Let's see first. I don't want to 86 anything this early in the game. We've got a couple of hours to fix it. It might just be the mix of mushrooms. All that earthiness is overwhelming the broth. Yeah, maybe cream will smooth it out better, so it'll still be rich, but not quite so earthy. You're doing a great job, Poppy. Don't worry about it. Adam used his nickname for his daughter, knowing it would ease her concerns. Hey, where's the big man? A deep, rich voice bellowed. Turning, Adam and Mia both recognized Earl Dapper, owner of Rock's Bar and Grill. Adam smiled as he walked over to shake Earl's hand. What are you doing here? Came to wish you a successful opening night. Still hate losing you as my head chef and taking Dominic with you, but the restaurant looks good. Thanks, Earl. I heard you moved Jeremy up to head chef. He did well unto me. I know he'll do a great job for you, too. He ain't got your presents. I think he thinks he's still on the line and forgets to call out the orders. He'll grow into it. I know he will. And his food is good. He will. So are you ready for tonight? Almost. A few more things to prep and then ready to have the guests come in. Nervous? Earl looked around the kitchen with the eye of a long-time restaurateur. Not really. More excited and anxious than nervous. You've worked for someone else for quite a number of years. Running your own place is much different. I know, but I like having more control over my menus, and Eve is great for the books and management, so I can still focus on what I love. Well, I'll be back tonight. I just wanted to wish you good luck and get a glimpse of the place before you got too hectic. Thanks for stopping by. 
He shook hands with Earl again, walking him towards the back door. When the door opened, Mia saw a beautiful Siamese cat peering in. Like her mom, Mia loved animals, and she worried this one was probably hungry and looking for food. Scooping up a bit of her duck scraps, she seared them quickly, then headed out to feed the poor little thing. She didn't see the feline at first, but called to him to see if he was nearby. He might have smelled the food or heard her, but, she, but soon he peeked his head out from behind the dumpster. She had the scraps of duck on a small plate. It's okay, little guy. We'll have lots of food for you. This is just for starts. She set the plate down and stepped back. Hmm, no collar, she mused. Hope the animal catcher doesn't get you. She re-entered the business and got back to work after she washed her hands. Chapter 3 The restaurant was hopping. So many came, they quickly turned over tables three and four times before the night settled down. Adam and Eve were ecstatic. Things were going well, and if it stayed like this, they were going to have a success on their hands. People had always liked Adam's food. They would frequently find out where he was or what nights he was working just to have him as their chef. They knew, no matter what they ordered, it would be prepared perfectly. Adam was a stickler for not letting anything leave his kitchen unless he okayed it. He had a reputation for getting clean plates and having very few returned with any issues. His opening night was no disappointment. Halfway through service, Mia had to 86 the mushroom soup, not because she hasn't, hadn't fixed the issue from earlier, but because they ran out. They ran out of a lot of things throughout the service, not anticipating that people would order two of three of everything early on. By the end of the night, they had very little left, and the entire staff was exhausted. Mia took out a couple of bags of garbage from her station and those nearby. She noticed the duck scraps were gone, so brought the plate back in. On another trip, trip, she noticed the Siamese was still nearby, so brought out some of the fish scraps, checking quickly to make sure there were no bones. Leaving the plate out again, she returned to cleaning up. She couldn't remember being so tired. She'd had a few opportunities to go into the restaurant itself, whether it was Eve or Adam who wanted to show her off, or for people who just wanted to meet the person who made one of her menu items. She recognized many who visited, Mr. and Mrs. Hennessy, whose cow was infamously being tipped over, Mr. and Mrs. Antonio, her history teacher and her husband, the Chase family, of which she was friends with their son, Caleb, police detective and family friend of the family, Phil Hardy, police chief Decker and his family, the Summer family, whose roots went as far back as the founder of the town, James Summer, the Summer statue in the town's Ware was infamous for being vandalized yearly in a pink tutu and red paint for lipstick and rouge when the school season was over. It happens like clockwork, but the only city officials seemed to mind, and then mostly because of the money it cost to clean it up. In a small town such as the Midlands, it was easy to know most everyone, and as such, hard to keep any secrets. Yet Mia couldn't think of any place she'd rather be. She loved the town and its strange, sometimes odd bill ball people. The Midlands was the perfect place. It had its own lake, Lake Henderson, perfect for boating, fishing, and swimming. It was close enough to the bigger towns of Plainville and only 45 minutes to Bloomington Normal, which was probably where she'd go to college when the time was right. Before she knew it, the last customer was leaving and she could finally collapse. Mia checked on the plate she'd left for the cat. Seeing it empty once again, she brought the plate in and added it to the dishwasher's pile. Her station cleaned. She took the last of the trash out and was about to meet her mom to head home when the phone rang.